Welcome everyone to our first, final uh, session for today, day one of the uh, of the uh, conference. It's been uh, a wonderful day uh, so far, and uh, we are so happy to have another session on positive education. We started this morning with Dr. Christiane Christiansen uh, speaking about it, and now we uh, will finish with this summit, the future of positive education. Our, uh, this again is a summit. Uh, a summit is somewhat different from other types of sessions in that, that it really emphasizes the exchange of ideas. So it might be a little bit more informal than some of the other sessions. Our organizer for today is Dr. Paul Wong. He's Professor Emeritus of Trent University in Ontario. Our first speaker is Gilda Sharp. She's a positive psychology expert, education consultant, and international keynote speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Brendan W. Case. He is the Associate Director for Research at Harvard's, Harvard University's Human Flourishing Program. And our third and final speaker is Dr. Julia Yang Blagan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She is a professor at National Kaohsiung Normal University in Taipei. So we will begin with uh, Dr. Wong's um, opening statement. I'd like to welcome you all to this important summit on the future of positive education. If you are a parent, you're, of course you are concerned about your child's education. Most parents, are concerned about their, their children's future. They want their children to achieve good grade, go to top university, and get good jobs. And they, in their mind, that is the, the best gift they can give to their ch children. But I think Martin Silliman is correct that in, a, in addition to academic curriculum, our children also need part of education in order to live a good life. I think the great educator Aristotle said, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. So Sidman is correct in emphasizing a part of education, but I do not think that uh, the most important thing for part of education is happiness. So in, in his beginning statement, he said that uh, part of education is focused on the skill for happiness. Children do not need to be taught how to, how to be happy. They, they, by nature, they want to have fun. They want to have happiness. They want to have pleasure. In fact, I'm very really worried when, when, see, when see the children spend most of their time entertaining themselves by watching their favorite program on TV or playing their favorite games. But oh, you must you spend time studying hard. It's not the best way to to prepare children for the future because we are living in a very uncertain world. They need a lot more than head knowledge on how to be happy to survive in an uncertain and difficult future. Now here is a picture. The teacher, it, it hard, it's difficult for teacher to be happy in today's environment. It's difficult for anyone to be happy in today's environment. In fact, more and more research shows that 
the pursuit of happiness itself can make you unhappy. Because you focus on yourself, you're bound to be disappointed because often things do not go your way. So I think the whole emphasis on, on the pursuit of happiness or happiness skills it is, might be counterproductive. Often it results in toxic positivity. That pursuing or practicing happiness makes you more miserable. So later on, Cinnamon broadened his focus. So now part of education emphasizes part of emotion, engagement, positive relations, human meaning, and encouragement. All those are good things. But in and by themselves, they will not work either. Because it's not possible to have positive emotion, positive emotion all the time. Because we all have our unhappy moments. We all have our dark side. So true positivity, you learn how to embrace dark side and still see the light. If it took to be truly engagement, truly engage with activity to the point of experiencing the flow. But that requires a lot of practice and a lot of painful discipline. Same thing with positive relationship. Do you know, if people say, oh, I'm so happy to be in love. I'm so happy to have fun. If I'm not happy, then I will break up. It's, it's, it's so many divorces. Strong relationship involving forgiveness, gratitude, and kindness, in spite of the pain other people gave to you. More recent research showed that uh, the, the thing that mediate well being and successful successful. Uh, marriages have uh, for forgiveness and endurance and kindness. So, you want not happy, I don't have a happy feeling, let's split. And that is not only selfish but naive. Same thing with meaning. Most think that, uh, oh, I want to be meaning, so you're happy. And, and, and it's, Advertising, advertising also use meaning as, as a slogan. Uh, but if you really want to have meaning in life, you have to transcend your ego, transcend your limitation, and willing to sacrifice. Finally, achievement also. You cannot achieve anything without your willingness to fail and to sacrifice. So this, this is. So the whole idea of public education, we need to reimagine and rethink what is good at, what is possible education. Here, I recall again, the rules of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. You cannot have achieve eudaimonia you cannot achieve excellence in anything without going through the pain of struggle, of overcoming, of failure. So if our children are not prepared for the hardship of life, or one of the fun, they don't have much of future. So this is uh, from uh, this statement and from Dr. Scott Pack. That's difficult. This is the great truth. You, anyone who dismisses this truth, expect life to be easy, already lost half the battle before the war started. So we, we need to change our mindset 
that positive technology must involve preparing children for hardship. So one way is to, they need to know who the, who the real are, they really know, need to know the bright side, the dark side. They also need to know how to live with, with the dark side and bright, and bright side. How to have the courage to do the right thing. And these are, these are fundamental. Okay. Finally, the best gift we can give to our children is that in, in part of education is to learn to have faith in themselves, faith in humanity, faith in God, and also to develop hope, hope in a better future, hope that it can make a difference, hope they can contribute to humanity, to their own life, and also need to learn how, how to connect with people, how to connect with themselves, and how to love. Love is not just feeling. So, so in this symposium, I trust that the, our distinguished panelists can all bring their perspective on a different kind of particular education that teach children the, the reality of, of human existence and prepare them better for an uncertain and harsh future. Okay, time for our panelists. Bye. Right. Go ahead, Gilda. Oh, right. <laughs> so I wasn't quite sure if it's me. Right. Um, well, um, thank you very much for um, always very interesting to hear different different spins of or really what positive psychology on positive education is. And um, I was going to refer to um, what the founder of uh, American psychology, William James, stated and outlined that the need for a more nuanced understanding of human endurance and the need for topography of the limits of human power. Now, in addition to making headways in understanding how children flourish and also understanding the mental illness and the causes of diseases, I think we have to expand the conceptual landscape of psychology. And the problem is that today's students face a future of environmental degradation, global warming, famine, poverty, health pandemic, population explosion, terrorism, only to name a few. And this complexity and stress um, has taken a toll on our young people's mental health. And in the UK, um, uh, very um, uh, fresh research coming out, shows that about 25% of our young people aged between 15 to 19 have a mental disorder and one in three young people experience moderate to high levels of psychological distress. So if this is not the right time, I don't know what other time we need to implement preventative measures to deal with the decline of the mental health, but also to empower young people to flourish. But the big question in education is how? And I think uh, one of the um, difficulties with positive education is that we have research in psychology and we have a little bit of research in education and they never seem to marry very well. And the question is, is that positive education the answer? Now, I'm not gonna go through because Paul did a wonderful job explaining that the positive education is the spin off of, from positive psychology and um, you know, you all heard about the definition that is an education for both traditional skill and happiness. But a good school doesn't just aim for its students to achieve their academic potential. It also aims to develop them as caring, responsible, and ultimately produ productive members of the society. The question I keep being asked a lot, is positive education enough or is it another fad in education? Now the answer, I think it's perhaps because nothing uh, is static in education. We are evolving continuously. My concern when I started working with schools and implementing positive education was, it was always seemed to be seen either too positive or not authentic enough. So I started examining different disciplines like the philosophy of education, existential psychology, the Stoics, just to expand the concept and the definition of positive education. 
Now, we all know that students will experience a range, a range of uncertainties and stresses, obstacles and anxiety at some point in their lives, being academic, emotional or social. Now, this may include disagreements with peers, may test or class presentation, transition from one school to another, exam pressures, conflict with teachers or parents, competition, just again to name a few. Students need the right tools and strategies as early as possible. And we need to engage them in activities that stretch that resilience and mental toughness and learn how to embrace uncertainties and seek challenges. Because choosing to build mental toughness allows students to expand their capacity and dive into the deep end, regardless of the outcome. Now, as a parent or educators, how many times you have seen your students or your children struggle to cope with pressure of exams or school in general, or even relationships? because they were scared of either failing or not reaching your expectations. Now, we know that building well-being and resilience are vital developing um, efficient problem-solving skills, building and maintaining interpersonal relationships, and all greatly enhance that person's or individual's ability to perform and contribute meaningfully in daily life. But that, where does a man mental toughness come in this context and how does it relate to positive education? I always feel positive education is a uh, positive education is kind of the springboard for mental toughness, just kind of lays the, 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 the road for it. Um, I will describe that mental toughness is an overarching term that entails positive psychological resources, which have been conceptualized as the possession of enabling experientially developed and heritable psychological resources like values, attitudes, emotions, cognition, behavior, and that facilitates achievement and promote positive mental, mental health. Now, these such psychological resources are critical for achievement for desirable life outcomes in domains, including but not limited to education, interpersonal relationship and work. Now, on the opposite side, the mental health problems are associated with poor academic performance, attrition, disengagement, suicidal thoughts and eating disorders. When I work with students in schools, um, it appears um, when, we put, um, we, when we put programs in school for mental toughness uh, in correlation, so, or in, in parallel with the positive education, looks like the mentally tough indi indi individuals have a high level of self-efficacy, commitment, focus, and are able to maintain greater levels of emotional control under stressful situation which can, of course, lead to better psychological well-being. Now, Gujarati said that uh, mental toughness is a state-like psychological resource that is purposeful, flexible, and efficient in nature for the enactment and maintenance of goal-directed pursuits. Collectively, the mental toughness definition reflects the core assumption that the construct represents an aggregation of personal resources, which resides within the person, the individual, and it's continuous and it helps them to deal with everyday stresses and major life events. It helps students stave off the potential negative past psychological effects of challenging experiences and encourage them to see obstacles as opportunities and involves more than continuing to persist despite difficulties. Mentally tough students interpret academic or social challenge in a very positive and optimistic way. They may include increasing effort and persistence, but also developing their metacognitive skills, learning new strategies and practicing gratitude. Now the education system at the moment moves students um, through the system, they learn some stuff, they pass some tests, they graduate with acceptable repertoire of knowledge and skills, acceptable enough to function, to continue on to college, to survive uh, more or less, but it's acceptable enough should the education system aim for acceptable? And how about building skills which are necessary to navigate life uncertainties? I felt that a common problem with the positive education program designed to nurture and strengthen, strengthen character traits um, or even alter behavior is that the program itself can be seen by the students as inauthentic and irrelevant. There are many cases where a program designed to encourage one type of behavior has the exact opposite effect. And if uh, I recall well, in the about 1980s, there was um, 
uh, in schools was commonly taught, um, um, uh, children were commonly taught the danger of smoking, only to see a huge rise in the number of children smoking. And uh, I think only recently, uh, Frank Dobbin, an anthropologist, and Alexandra Kalev demonstrated through a meta-analysis entitled, Why Doesn't Diversity Training Work? That hundreds of studies dating back to the 1930s suggest that anti-bias training doesn't reduce bias, alter behavior, or change the workplace. So there are reasons why such training doesn't work, why the most important, um, some of the most important work of our researchers in psychology or positive psychology or cognitive uh, psychology, it's lacking authenticity, authenticity and relevance in the classroom. Now, if we were to encourage young people to learn from past failure or to learn how to make failure productive, there is very little point in simply telling them that this is a good tactic to adopt in life without providing the opportunity actually to experience the benefits of productive failure. To support the school in developing the positive behavioral traits in students, we need to take ideas they have learned in the positive education curriculum or mental toughness or resilience curriculum and ensure they are implemented in their routine experience in school life. These require programs of uh, professional development in teacher. We need to up upskill the teachers. This may sound simple, but some of the ideas we were asking teachers to implement in their classroom may appear unusual. Um, and most of the feedback which I got from the teachers was like, oh, but that's not my job or that, that's not, I don't know how to do this. So definitely the upskilling and the investment in training is it's paramount. But furthermore, some of the ideas actually might go against the dominant or the educational orthodoxy and can leave some teachers very unsettled. But with the support of the school leadership, we can encourage most teachers to rethink their own approaches to teaching, their own pedagogy. Um, and I should caution those interested in the work that uh, we have done before, not to underestimate the time and energy we need to, needs to be supported, these teachers in developing those th techniques and strategies. And um, uh, I would like to outline just a couple of strategies which I feel they demonstrate how they differ from the more common places in schools. Um, a common uh, approach found in school is based on the idea that teachers should seek to boost the self-esteem of students. Now, of course, we should not do the opposite of it, but in the efforts to help children feel good about themselves, they have used praise indiscriminately and insisted that all the children are winners. Now, in the schools I work with, the praise is used very wisely. The school philosophy is, is mainly, we don't praise mediocrity. And found in teachers' guidebook, we, we, we created guidebooks for the teachers. It's featured in a regular training of these teachers. Now, in this course, praise is only given when a student has achieved something they previously could not do. So that increases a bit of a self-awareness, a bit of autonomy from the student, a greater understanding of if I fail, if I take a task which I'm not necessarily very good at, I know that I can try 10,000 times, but 10,000 in one time, I will succeed. Another common feature of the school is highlighted by Catherine Eccleston, which she, um, she's a professor of education at University of Sheffield in England. Um, and she described the idea that children should not experience anxiety in their schooling. Now, of course, without the experience of anxiety, we all know that uh, perhaps the nerves we feel before an examination or a, or a sport competition or speaking in public, we will not learn the strategies of a positive psychology, which enables us to manage this anxiety, or even to see anxiety as anything other than an inherently bad thing. Students don't have the ability to say, what is good anxiety, what's bad anxiety, they can't distinguish. And in this course where I'm working with teachers, they have accepted the argument that children need to experience anxiety, healthy anxiety, a challenge, and even failures so they can learn from it. Um, and um, it's the, uh, what Stephen Baskin uh, calls the gift of failure, which I absolutely love that because we see failure as such a negative thing in our society. And however, this has been difficult for teachers when we, we asked them to do this, uh, when the, uh, because the early training was suggesting exactly the opposite, we realized that some teachers need to unlearn how to teach. And um, an example of how we address this was the introduction of the notion of um, authentic dissent. 
and creative conflict, conflict in a classroom discussion. Hi, Gilda. Sorry to interrupt, Gilda. Um, um, Running out you, of time. Can you, can you wrap up and then we'll, we'll yeah. move on to Brendan. Right, so what is the future of education? Um, I think if schools are to nurture their students, their personal, emotional, and moral, intellectual courage and independence of successful adults, then they must guide the students towards understanding the components of positive and resilient psychology. And teachers must enable the students to build and practice mental toughness through programs of teaching, which offer authentic experience of gentle pressure and constantly applied and encourage the effort of realistic understanding. And I'm really hopeful that this is an opportunity for us to, to kind of unpick more. It's, it's less about what we learn, it's more about, we owe it to ourselves to kind of any young people of the future to, to put more research into positive education and to evolve what positive, positive education looks like in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Gilda. Go ahead, Brendan. Very good, thanks, Dan. Thank you, Gilda. Well, good evening and greetings from Boston. Uh, can you can everyone hear me? Okay, you're good. Okay, very good. So, uh, my title for this presentation is "Moral Exoskeletons for the Mediocre Many: R Religious Lessons for Positive Education." I'm honored to be included in this distinguished panel on the future of positive education and want to extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Wong for inviting me. I should caution at the outset, however, that I must speak as a relative outsider to the discipline of positive education and indeed positive psychology as a whole. I'm a Christian theologian by training and my research interests lie principally in how my own discipline interacts and overlaps with social and moral and cognitive psychology. Tonight, I'd like to bring those interests to bear on one key aim of the positive education movement as I understand it, namely the ambition to help students identify and cultivate character strengths, such as honesty, loyalty, kindness, gratitude, and fairness, among many others. These qualities are not, or at least not principally, morally neutral personality traits, such as excellence, morally praiseworthy dispositions to act for the good what philosophers have traditionally referred to as virtues. Now I realize that some positive psychologists treat philosophers or theologians, both honesty and wisdom, for instance, are virtues. Now to count as a virtue, a trait needs to be relatively stable across both time and context. We wouldn't say that someone possessed the virtue of honesty simply on the basis of one act of costly truth-telling nor would we ascribe that virtue to someone who is consistently truthful in his business dealings, but also consistently duplicitous in his marriage. A key question for positive education then is whether this kind of context invariant disposition to act for the good, virtue, can be taught to most or even many people. As it happens, there are some significant complications in executing this ambition, particularly on a mass scale, as is evident from the mixed results of some interventions inspired by Martin Seligman's PERMA theory, such as the disappointing results from a 2014 controlled trial of the UK Resilience Program or from the US Army's Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Training Program. The mixed evidence for the effectiveness of these interventions is consistent with a large body of experimental and observational findings, often labeled as psychological situationism, which suggests that most people don't in fact possess any context independent virtues or for that matter vices. Instead, most people's propensities for honesty, generosity, kindness or the like vary enormously across contexts and are highly sensitive to influence by situational factors, many of them seemingly quite trivial. The experimental findings range from the amusing to the horrifying. One controlled trial found that people were almost twice as likely, 80% compared with 45%, to help a stranger if they had just emerged from a bathroom than if they were walking down a hallway. While another found that people were much less likely to help a stranger if they had just seen a computer screensaver of dollar bills floating in water. Both of these are examples of the priming effect. The compromising setting of the bathroom seems to subtly shame us into being accommodating, while the sight of money subtly provokes an attitude of assertive self-interest. Other findings strike a darker tone. In his book, The Character Gap, the philosopher Christian Miller 
surveys the experimental and observational evidence that substantial majorities of college students, 60 to 80 percent, depending on the survey, cheat at least a little on tests when given the opportunity. He also discusses experimental findings, which suggest that apparently anodyne environmental factors, forcing the test taker to assign a copy of the honor code immediately beforehand, or even just seating him in front of a mirror, reduce cheating by as much as 90%. The darkest and most famous of the situationist, situationist experiments in psychology were conducted in the 1960s by Stanley Milgram, who found that nearly all of his test subjects could be pressured by an authority figure into administering what they believed to be painful electric shocks to a total stranger, and that 65% were willing even to administer a deadly 450 volt shock. Most of us are in fact far less able to resist the influence of even obviously misguided or evil authorities than we probably flatter ourselves to be. In short, a great deal of research, much of it replicated and with large effect sizes, suggests that most people's propensities for kindness, honesty, indifference, or even cruelty seem to be highly context dependent rather than principally or even largely the, pro the product of stable virtues or vices, which are active across contexts. This doesn't necessarily rule out the idea that many people possess, say, weak virtues or vices in the sense of traits which explain a relatively small proportion of variance in their behavior across contexts. Nonetheless, the principal findings of situationism seem to me to be well established. I suspect we'd all agree that someone who uh, that someone who's honest when there's a mirror present during a test, but dishonest when there's no mirror, doesn't possess the virtue of honesty. And this odd mixture of traits seems to be typical of most of us. I should stress, however, that this sensitivity of our actions, actions to situations needn't be taken to imply a crude behaviorism in which actions are mechanically elicited by environments. Rather, situational influences are usually indirect, mediated largely by unconscious beliefs and desires which are aroused by subtle environmental cues. Situationist psychologists thus typically have a robust theory of the intuitive unconscious mind, Jonathan Haidt's elephant or Daniel Kahneman's system one, as anticipating, shaping, and often biasing the work of its slower conscious counterpart, Haidt's writer, Kahneman System 2. The findings of situationism are counterintuitive. If you're like me, you're probably eager to take full conscious credit for your noble actions in particular, but they aren't particularly surprising from the standpoint of many theological or philosophical traditions. St. Paul, for instance, was quite clear about humanity's general moral impotence. There is none righteous, no, not one, he writes in Romans 3. As Christian Miller suggests, the Christian can consistently hold for various reasons, such as personal sin, original sin, the fall, the devil and his minions, that most people, including most Christians, do not live up to the standards of being even weakly virtuous. And this is not necessarily a uniquely Christian perspective either. The findings of situationism are also arguably consistent with the Buddha's teaching and the second noble truth that we suffer because of our insatiable cravings, tanha, from perishable things. And even Aristotle, the greatest of the virtue theorists, observed that the many do not abstain from bad acts because of their baseness, but, because of, but through the fear of punishment. In his important book, Aristotle on the Virtues, historian of philosophy Howard Kurzer comments that for Aristotle, the category of the many includes not only children, but also the majority of adults, for these adults, in his view, are morally childish. The evidence for psychological situationism we've considered so far might suggest that environmental influences on human behavior are virtually all fleeting and contingent, a shifting tide of impressions which sweep across the unconscious. This impression, however, would be misleading, for there are many environments which do in fact shape human behavior in stable and generally pro-social ways. One of the most important of these are religious communities. As large as the literature supporting situationism is, there is an equally large literature documenting the manifold effects on human flourishing of participation in religious communities. And I'm proud to say that our, re our researchers at HFH have contributed a great deal to that literature in the past five years. We have found, for instance, that those who attended religious services at least weekly were about 50% less likely to divorce and five times less likely to commit suicide than those who never attended. We've also found that adolescents who attend services regularly were 87% more likely to be highly forgiving and had a 33% lower risk of illegal drug use and a 40% lower risk of contracting an STD compared to never attenders. In the character gap, Miller discusses a number of related findings. 
including that domestic violence is 48.7% higher among male survey participants who do not attend church, as opposed to men who attend religious services once a week or more, while charitable giving is about three and a half times higher among regular attenders than never attenders. What's striking about all of these examples, which could be multiplied ad nauseum, is that they show that participation in religious communities seems to reliably produce the kind of behaviors which we are all inclined to ascribe to the virtues or character strengths. Religious, religious participation seems to incline people to more consistently display generosity, forgiveness, gentleness, and prudence. Possessing a virtue is its own reward, of course, but consistent patterns of action in accord with the good are one of the virtue's most important consequences. But how Sorry, can, Brennan, can you wrap up in a minute or two, please? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, I can. Uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, I've, I've obviously written a presentation that's too long. I do apologize. Um, well, okay, so just briefly, let me just cut to the, the last page, so to speak, of the paper. So what I want to suggest, I suppose, is that uh, these two bodies of evidence that I've just considered seem like their intention, uh, but they only, they only seem that way because of our intuition, or at least my sort of instinctive intuition, that... Uh, religious communities affect people's behavior by way of a, by way of changing their character uh, in the sense of implanting virtues in them. Uh, and one one possible way of resolving the apparent tension between those two these two bodies of evidence, situationism and psychology, and and uh, uh, the the evidence from a sociology of religion is is uh, that religious communities might might actually act uh, at least in 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 large part on their participants by way of the priming effect that I've just described as, a, as, so, as such an important factor in, in cognitive uh, psychological findings. So uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's another interesting body of literature, which I was going to go on to talk about, about the, the way in which God primes, as they're called by, by psychologists, affect uh, a human behavior in, 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 in a whole variety of ways. So eliciting uh, more, more generous or, or, uh, or just responses in, in multiplayer uh, you know, psychological games. And uh, in any case, I suppose the, 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 the suggestion I wanted to end with uh, in the, the presentation is that uh, we, might, uh, we, we might consider that if, uh, if the prospects for inculcating the virtues in large numbers of people are somewhat dim, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to skepticism myself in this regard, that positive education might consider uh, taking a leaf out of the, uh, the, the demonstrably successful track record of religious communities and in, in relying instead more heavily on uh, uh, a, a crowded field of, of priming effects of various kinds. And so there are, uh, I, I could give more examples, but it probably shouldn't at the moment. I'll, I'll see, I'm happy to see the field and maybe we could pursue this more during the discussion. Okay, thank you, Brendan. And uh, take it away, Julia. Thank you. Um, need to uh, give me the right to share the desktop. So thank you. Oh, not yet. Well, I'm very humbled by your talk, uh, Brendan, um, and your experience, Khalilda. Yeah, so um, I hope um, this one, <laughs> um, I thought at the end of the day, I give people a little entertainment, but maybe too much. But anyway, um, the, the, let me try this. Um, I'm the most disqualified person to speak to this uh, topic called the future of positive education, because I dismissed um, po um, positive psychology in the 2004, five-ish when I was working on my book called The Psychology of Courage. Courage is named for a character trait. Um, courage is a verb. Likewise, what I like to call God and love a verb. And so, um, but, you know, I love Paul greatly. I would not disappoint Paul. So, so let me be a clown for a little bit. What do you hear from Trump at this moment? Um, and when I saw this uh, picture uh, last March, last year, I knew something big was to happen. But I thought I heard he was saying, why should I love my neighbor? And Edler supposedly would have interpreted that, oh, what a pampered child. 
but with not without great prices. So, um, but anyway, you could tell from my tone that I might be a little angry uh, at this guy. But given the, the topic that I'm to pursue here, um, if you might use your cell phone to approach this QR code, there's an article that I wrote per um, Paul's encouragement to reconcile the difference between Franco and Edler. Um, so that's on Paul's website. And Edler um, is for peace, not for comp you know, competition. So I gave myself the two premises as to fulfill for today, but I don't think I can cover all that I had, you know, that had come through my mind. So what does it take for us to have and cultivate social feeling? Um, so I saw that we have some colleagues from Taiwan and I admire them in such a way that uh, they're life educators. They worked on this thing for two or three decades and finally they got it into the Ministry of Education curriculum standard to have a curriculum space for education that's about life. Um, I, you know, I was a dropout educator. I was a school teacher and I dropped out earlier from higher education too. When I did not know was I an artist or was I a, a teacher, I became a counselor. How funny, right? But, you know, I became a counselor educator and I dropped out of higher education because I wanted to do some community work. And God gave me this opportunity. April 2nd, I was on the air, ready to land in uh, Taiwan, when a few hours later, this uh, humongous uh, train wreck happened. Um, so it was um, uh, April 2nd. But as you can tell that by April 14th, we finished um, our service. Um, online uh, post-trauma um, stress management. Um, and and um, 150 people participated. 30 some people participate as professionals, all credentialed pro properly. Um, and and um, I was in quarantine hotel until April the 17th, but I was doing this from the hotel. So I began to imagine, I don't have a wall. I don't have a wall for, for the love that we want to deliver. So, but anyway, there are a whole lot of, you know, um, public domain materials that, that uh, we can use. But it was uh, very interesting that it was only after our service that we began to see on the news that people were arguing who was qualified to do what. Um, and to comfort those people. And out of 150 participants, there were calls from Europe and, and America um, because this um, event evolved a whole lot of pain and suffering in, from their memories of maybe losing the loved ones. So coming back to individual psychology or elders on psychology, um, we, we do have the problems of wanting to move from the less than to uh, superiority uh, or perceived uh, superiority, but we overdo it. Um, so we create problems in all our relationships. Education is not problem free. And I'm not qualified to criticize education, but who said that psychology and education cannot work together? And I take, took it from Gladia. Um, so when we have such a split and duality uh, type of concept and, and in Taiwan, it's pretty terrible. It's posi positionality, hierarchy, who has more power? Even though Taiwan aspires for equality, we have a long way to go. Um, so instead of the future of education, I thought we go backward, you know, back to the future. So two things, you know, one is we treat the child as a whole person. The other one is social feeling. And actually, Eller had a debate with um, a Catholic priest, you know, um, it's not agape love. Social feeling is we love our neighbors only you know, because Edler was humble enough to say that he did not study theology. 
So out of this chart, I would like to invite you to look at the, the movement, uh, the, the, the line of activities. Um, and I think this where I have a box here is uh, closer to what you know um, Paul might be thinking about uh, self transcendence. So um, in one brief conversation, Paul said, "Well, maybe the horizontal one is uh, self transcendence, and the vertical one is spirituality." So I, you know, I added the number. Four for A, um, you know, to the theory, but prior to now, it's only three, A to the third, but now I'm having A to the fourth. So, so we, we education plays quite a crucial role in bringing out those uh, innate potentialities that we, we were made to have. And so, you know, um, we, we have the, the, um, the structure here, but nowadays, neuroscience, epigenetics, um, theology, and, and more, quantum theorists, they're all talking about this wholeness. Um, so, by Edler, you know, has a few points. Um, and then please stop me when you need to. Um, I have no yeah, idea. Maybe one or two more minutes, uh, Julia. Okay, so um, this is a mission impossible. I'm not even Tom Cruise. So, so but anyway, um, th this is what you know. We need to be focused on uh, about the interaction between the environment and the. So there's no subjectivity, subjectivity and objectivity per se, but wholeness. Uh, that we need to con concern ourselves about. Throughout the day, I took notes of all the speakers and what you have to contribute is this chart that I drew this uh, stick figure that you are to help this child become a whole person, not to have these connected syndromes. So I'm gonna move um, uh, a little faster here. So I came to United States when I was 1983. Now looking back, I think what I was exposed to in counseling and psychology was too much on self-esteem um, and, and too little on critical thinking and you know, reflection. And I know self-transcendence um, and transformation to Paul is um, you know, self-reflection, self-awareness, determinism, and, and there in psychology, we'll probably will call it choice and responsibility. And then you know, uh, I took note here, I hope to find it, self-transcendence. So self-transcendence is to move, move away from me. So here we have uh, David Hawkins, who was um, 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 you know, a psychiatrist to say that, live your life like a prayer. You know, move up by choice, choose love because love heals. And, and it, we combine those two together. Self-transcendence is about the courage to heal. It's not about the trauma itself. It's about how we take in the trauma and how we decide to, to, to um, um, you know, um, respond. And when we respond, we respond in, in style. So here is a style talk. And um, so Edder would have said that there is mistaken meaning making. And, and um, the, our response in education and training is this. This is probably the most important chart I'd like to show today. Um, we, we can train the teachers, we can train the parents, you know, how a physician can be an educator, therapeutic education, so forth. There are individual education schools around the world. So this is something when we did uh, for three years, um, working with uh, 12,000 people. But, but anyway, the light brown, not the, the bright brown, the light greenish brown is the interracial uh, kids in Taiwan. They were low, but they become higher uh, with um, you know, what I just did, the, the 4C training. So the pandemic and I, you know, I still have the 4C stuff, you know, continue going. But fundamentally, individual psychology takes on the first word. 
every person is indivisible. We're one unit. What are we talking about in okay, terms of sorry, duality? Julia, I'm going to have to uh, interrupt you there. Yeah, um, this is okay. my email for PowerPoint and references. Thank you. And okay. uh, those are my kids. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, That's okay. So it's time. Um, I'm going to uh, reintroduce Paul in, as the discussant for our summit. And, um, and so uh, without further ado, uh, go ahead, Paul. Okay, uh, Gokman is supposed to be a discussion, but for some reason uh, he could not be here. So I just want to say a few words to wrap, wrap it up. So we can see here that we all have different perspective on how to provide the best education for children. Okay? So I come from a theology background, so I, I can understand Brendan. Okay? I'm also a constant psychologist. I'm an educator, so I can relate to everybody. I think for, as parents, as teachers, we're all concerned about the next generation. The question we should ask ourselves, how is the best way to prepare our children to face an uncertain and difficult future. Because today's job might not exist tomorrow. And they have to be able to be creative. And the old fashioned way, I just talk to another client and say, Oh, my plan for myself is the private school, the best university, and get the professional. I think it's old fashioned, I say. I say that the old way of thinking, the best education, the best job, help the child to develop the best they can in order to make contribution. There's some, I mean, the situationism versus absolutism, nurture, nature, debate, it never ends. But the word education means that we can do something as parents as educator, we can cultivate certain tra traits, certain virtues that enable them to survive chaos, trauma, and to develop their most best potential. That, I mean, it's unfortunate that, 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 that I use the word positive education because I live long enough to know that when it comes to character education, and, and religious education, or whatever you call it. But the bottom line is that, how can we best prepare our children to be the best they could, and how to make the world a better world? How we can equip them with the mentality, the skill necessary to cope with all the demands life might throw at them. So we can forget about doing school, doing perspective, that to me is what is positive, is how to bring out that the best potential and give them the most adaptive skill account to science to cope with changes and difficulties and rise above it. Another idea that I have is that forget about this person as isolated, closed and skin, because we are much bigger than just a concrete entity. We're part of humanity, part of God's creation. What a good idea is that, that the education is just about you. Well-being is not just about you. The pandemic has taught us that it's about all of us. If one country has no vaccination, it will affect the whole wide world. If one family, if one person in a community refuse to be vaccinated, carry virus, it can affect many people. So we, we need to have a, a new mindset, not just me, 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 that we are all a rivers flowing to the same ocean. That what you do affect other people. So stop up with some me, me, me. That's why I'm going to 
my, my, my vision about public culture is less about ego, more about others, and more about God. And so I think that, that I think that uh, <laughs> this, this is my bias summary, I don't know. So any comment, I'm on a panel this. Hi, Paul. I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to move on from the me, me all the time and just look outside. And I think um, one of the, you know, the experiences which I have with education is that um, educators feel very isolated from psychology and they try. So when, when you bring something from psychology, they kind of put a wall and say, no, it's not for me. So I think we need to really close that gap between psychology and education research to be able to, to for, for teachers to actually understand what does it mean to look after one child, you know, holistically. What, how can we empower young people to flourish and give them the right competencies to, to navigate life challenges? Because that's all it is about picking yourself up when you are really at the bottom. And you do, you will go through the bottom because we all do, that's what life is. And young people these days don't have those skill set yet, very well developed. Oh, you can hear. Parents' yeah. education. Parents' education, teacher education, to my idea is not just knowledge. Yeah. Uh, you're a teacher, you model how to be a human being. A parent, you model how to be a decent human being. You know, I have two kinds of clients. Uh, we all know about this aversive childhood experience. So many of my clients were damaged by their parents, abusive and dominant, controlling. The other kind of, the other kind of my clients are crippled by their parents so spoiling. The small breath, the no real power, no courage to make decisions. So my clients, Chinese clients, you know, rich Chinese, they have to hire people to help them to go out. They're so afraid to go out there by themselves. The high people cook for them. They can't do anything. Mm. They, 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 they're not human being anymore. How, how do you human being? You, every day you play game, play camera, the parents feed you, parents support you. This one guy have two, two or three sports cars. And he's so bored with life, he had to pay money to kidnap him in Canada. Mm. They're bored with death, but they no meaning, no identity, no purpose. All they want to enjoy, enjoy. How you survive? Shame on those parents. So that's why it's, it's a, for education is really, you know, I, I, I see those young people can do anything at home. It is. Uh, it is. Young people with their lives. So it's, it's a routine matter. You know, it's, uh, I don't care how you call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask uh, Brendan for any final comments and then Julia. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? I do have a I have a window unit AC in the background, so I don't want it to be too noisy. I won't talk very long, but no, we uh, can hear yeah, good. Well, no, th yeah, thank, thank, thank you, uh, Paul, for those comments, and I, I, um, yeah, I certainly appreciate them. One, I guess, one thought I would, I would want to uh, leave with is the uh, part of the title of the talk. You know, what I chose for my talk is that it had included the, the expression "moral exoskeletons." You know, which is a bit of a strange phrase. It's from Jonathan <laughs> Haidt from his book "The Righteous Mind." Which I think is just just a, about a perfect description of what what religions provide in general for for people. You know, and it's a it's a lovely. What what he what he means is that what they provide is this uh, this sort of encompassing way of life. You know, this is why they're so effective in shaping behavior. They they don't just provide instruction. They do provide that, but they reinforce it in a thousand ways daily. And symbols that we wear on our bodies, and you know, practices that are embedded in our daily routines and the friends we make, you know, the foods we eat in some cases, right? And so, uh, and I think that that really, to me, is what sets religious communities in general apart from educational institutions, is, the, is this challenge of, and this is what I really meant by the, the priming effect, you know, every time, every time I see a cross, for instance, you know, as a Christian, that's a symbol which is just loaded with significance for me, which a lot of it is activated way below my conscious awareness even, you know? And so I think that, that education will become more successful, you know, in, in schooling, if it's able to take on board that that richer dimension 
of of human personality and motivation and behavior, which I just think in general, it's not is it, education today tends to fly way, way above 30,000 feet above that stuff, you know, and, and it turns out that's actually really what makes a difference, you know, in, in human life. So that that's sort of what I would commend, I suppose, to to educators and not speaking as a theologian myself and not a teacher you know I, I i recognize you have to do the work of translating you know but that that uh seems like a promising approach to me great thank you brennan and julia i thought jesus christ was a great teacher <laughs> by his actions but i just wanted to share a quote um, that i read from paul's uh, twitter uh when i let go of what i aim I become what I might be. And I think um, Paul quoted Lao Tzu, the Taoist um, um, you know, uh, the frontier, um, and that's 2,600 years of time before. And the Zen master I quoted in my PowerPoint um, by studying the Sotra of um, Diamond, uh, Sotra, uh, it says um, reality is a, uh, is a steadily flowing stream. And I think we contribute to that, that reality as time rolls onward. And, and we're, yeah, so, so I just wanted to thank you for all, you know, for, all for allowing me to have an opportunity to participate as a non-positive educator. Uh, thank you, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Julia, and thank you to our other panelists, Gilda and Brendan, and thank you, Paul, for uh, being the discussant for this summit. And uh, that wraps up uh, day one of our uh, meeting conference, and we'll see you all tomorrow morning at 7.30. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Now, this is full time. I see you. It is. And I hope to see you again soon. Ciao, uh, 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 and Brendan, so and uh, to cry. what's your name? My uh, heart is Julia. Uh, how to pronounce your name? I, I met Brendan before. Uh, how to pronounce your first name? Jilda. Right oh. Jilda, uh, Julia? Can I which one is it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. Nice to see you. Jilda, good to see you. A psychiatrist, a patient, taught us to clap online like this. So we will not wake up our family. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Never too late to start again. What breaks your heart will make.